right, everybody, it is time for Nostalgia Trap. I am your host, David Parsons. Thanks so much for tuning into the program. I hope you enjoy what we've got for you today. I learned a lot from this conversation, and I think you will too. My guest today is Ross Barkin. Ross is a journalist who covers New York State politics. He's been covering governor, or should I say ex-governor, Andrew Cuomo for the last eight years. And he is the person to correct the record on Andrew Cuomo's governorship, in particular, his handling of coronavirus. Ross has a book out that I think everybody should read. It's called The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus, and the Fall of New York. And as I tell Ross at the outset of this conversation, I was shaking with rage as I was reading this book. There are so many stunning, shocking details in it. Uh, and I'll leave those to this conversation because Ross explains them very well. And, and he also explains sort of the political dynamics of this. Cuomo plays the particular politics of New York State and New York City in really brilliant Machiavellian ways. And that's why this book is called The Prince, I think, although it might also have something to do with his father, Mario Cuomo. But this is a really fun conversation. And again, an absolutely vital story, I think. I think more people need to know that Cuomo is not just a problem because of the sexual harassment that, um, over which he left office. That stuff is important. Uh, but so is his killing uh, tens of thousands of people in nursing homes. And that's just honestly one bit of this. Uh, it's a really, really important story. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. I want to thank Ross Barkin for coming on and talking about the book. And I also want to mention that uh, Justin Rogers Cooper, our good friend and and my my co-host on this program, we, we both read this book and we were sort of so bowled over by it that we wanted to record a bonus conversation. So if you go over to our Patreon, that's at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Justin and I uh, had a conversation where we sort of take a lot of Ross's ideas and, and think about uh, the elements of uh, the, the wilder elements that they might suggest. So we're talking about like sort of the Cuomo sexual thing. Why liberals uh, had this sort of libidinal, erotic daddy attachment to Cuomo. It's important stuff. And I think it gets us into thinking about issues beyond just uh, class politics, beyond just, you know, sort of rational politics and into those weird erotic areas that we sometimes like to go on nostalgia trap. So if you want to hear some of that, you can do that at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. That episode is called Cuomo Sexuality with Justin Rogers Cooper. We had a lot of fun recording that. So go check that, go check that out if you're interested. Thanks so much and enjoy this conversation. Here is me talking with Ross Barkin. All right, Ross Barkin, I want to say the name of your book before we even get started because I just emailed you that I was reading it all weekend and shaking with rage, and I want to sort of uh, get that out with you today. It's called The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus, and the Fall of New York. Uh, Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Very excited to come on and chat. Well, uh... Like I said, I was shaking with rage reading this because part part of uh, part of that comes from uh, being a New Yorker for many years, and you know, working and and going to CUNY and being teaching at CUNY for many years. Andrew Cuomo's nefariousness was no secret to me. Uh, so watching the coronavirus unfold from California, because that's where I moved to and I live here now, and watching it on TV. And sort of this character be introduced. It was a very different Andrew Cuomo than I knew, uh, and I wonder if that was part of the sort of reason behind you wanting to write this book, which serves as a sort of counter narrative to the whole TV character. That was definitely a big part of it. And and I am from New York. I'm from New York City. I still live here, and I've been covering Cuomo. Had been, I should say, since he's no longer governor. Uh, from really 2012 onward. So he's someone that I was very aware of and, and very cognizant of. And I understood where he had succeeded and failed in the state of New York. And and when COVID hit, um, then as in now, I was writing um, for the nation and writing a lot on the first few weeks and months and the real failures to contain uh, COVID here and the ways the government failed to act. And I also did this on, on a Substack I started last May of 2020, 
um, where I also chronicled uh, this. And, and so, yes, my reporting was the genesis for the book and uh, the publisher at Order Books actually reached out to me in the fall of 2020 and asked me if I wanted to write a book about Cuomo and COVID uh, based on a lot of my articles and my commentary. And I agree. Um, in some sense, a lot of what I was doing was building toward the book, which I hope will be a corrective to the narrative that still exists that Andrew Cuomo succeeded in taming coronavirus in New York. And even with Cuomo's downfall, with his resignation from office, the, the real focus has been on his misconduct uh, among his own staff and people know him and, and his sexual harassment. And, and that deserves a lot of attention but it's also a scandal that many people assume is the reason that Cuomo should have been driven out of office and not for any other reason. And you'll hear a lot of people say, well, you know, he's a creep, but he's a good governor or was a good governor. And that's not really the case. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I, I avoid mm -hmm. sweeping generalizations. I wouldn't say he's a failed or horrible governor, but I will see, say he had many significant failures and taming COVID was one of them. Well, I mean, one of the reasons why, I mean, I found your, I mean, I found your book literally in Barnes and Noble, um, you know, in the same section as, as Cuomo's oh, memoir. Um, oh, it's made, it's made it to Barnes and I had no idea it's in Barnes and Noble. You now. know, I, I didn't know if I would see this. I just went over to the current affairs section, which is an absolute nightmare at Barnes and Noble. Um, and, and there it was. Um, and I, I was hoping I know I, there, there would be more of the copies to like kind of surround, uh, the Cuomo memoir. Because part of this, I mean, part of the reason I, I wanted to talk to you about this and, and why I think this book is so important is is really as a as an answer to like people like my mom who like literally kind of fell in love with Cuomo here in California while watching the news coverage every day and these press conferences that he had at eleven in the morning every every morning. Um, and she asked me because she knows I'm not a fan and like why don't you like Andrew Cuomo? You know what what's wrong with him? Um, and I sort of felt like. A lot of people don't didn't were introduced to Andrew Cuomo through this, right? Like especially people outside of New York, and it feels like part of um, when I sat trying to figure out how to explain to my mom what what the situation was, it seemed like a big story, and one of them was uh, one that you get out in your book, which is sort of I hope you could talk a little bit about, which is I don't know the relationship between between Albany and 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 New York City which it which seems like it's the context for a lot of this um that it seemed like I had to like start there uh to to sort of explain this this lopsided power relationship and how Cuomo took advantage of it does that make sense yes and New York is very weird it's different than other states where you don't have this dynamic to such a degree in California or anywhere else where there's one city and one city only that generates much of the wealth for the rest of the state and it's where a lot of people live. California obviously is a very big state. You have many large cities. New York state is really a dying Rust Belt state married to New York City, which mm. is this engine of economic growth and dynamism. And I, I want to include the caveat that I actually love upstate and I'm not here to slag on cities like Buffalo or Rochester or to, um, criticize the small towns of New York state. They're lovely, um, but, but the reality is that New York City is generating far more revenue than it's getting from the state. And, and that without New York City, New York state would, would probably be a, a pretty poor and struggling state nationally uh, because the forces of deindustrialization, um, the rise of free trade, all this, hit New York very hard. And we always think of the Midwest when we have these discussions, but, you know, Buffalo, Rochester, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of cities were just uh, annihilated in the second half of the 20th century. So you start with that dynamic, right? New York City, we know what New York City is, but a lot of what New York City can't can and can't do is controlled by Albany, which is the state capital, and it's controlled by the state legislature as controlled by the governor of New York. So the state has an inordinate power over the city. The New York City cannot raise its own minimum wage. It cannot raise its own income tax. It cannot determine the speed limits on its city streets. It does not control its own subway system. That is the MTA, which is a state authority, which the governor controls. The new governor, Kathy Hochul, refreshingly, 
does not pretend she doesn't control the MTA, which is a game Andrew Cuomo would play when there were train failures. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, th- this is definitely the dynamic underlying a lot of the tension. And Andrew Cuomo w- was someone who was very a- adept and sociopathic in many ways at exploiting it, at, at really um, tormenting New York City leaders undercutting them, undercutting Mayor Bill de Blasio and undercutting the city council, making policy changes without consulting anyone, doing things just because he could. I mean, I always give this example back in 2015 or so, there was a very big snowstorm that was supposed to hit New York City and Andrew Cuomo decided unilaterally he would shut down the entire subway system. And he decided this giving the mayor of New York something like, 15 minutes heads up and it's just i remember not the way a normal person governs this is the way he governed why is that i mean we can i I know you know your book it doesn't function as a deep psychobiography but there are hints of that in there Uh, um but but why why is andrew cuomo such a i don't know a, a chess player when it comes to dominating city leaders and particularly other democrats i mean it seems like that's his game more than owning the right is sort of blocking the left. Um, and it seemed like that's the, that's the reputation I certainly associated with him for years as a guy that uh, just sort of delighted in breaking the left and breaking Bill de Blasio and sort of almost, yeah, like you said, there's this kind of almost sadistic element to it, but he's really good at it too. What makes, or I should say what made, and I keep speaking in the present I tense. Know, I, I can't believe it, he's it's, gone. It, it's still strange. I still have not quite gotten used to it. Um, it's very refreshing, but it's just not something that, that is yet, uh, yet I've internalized because that Andrew Cuomo is a former governor of New York. Mm, yeah. What made him so different than other democratic governors. And I think this is true for pretty much any other democratic governor in America. Andrew Cuomo had very little interest in uplifting the democratic party in New York. And this sounds really strange to outsiders. And I think, and I think very few people who aren't steeped in New York politics uh, wouldn't really understand it because it's not something that you would encounter anywhere else. Gavin Newsom is not trying to help Republicans find a way to control the state Senate in California. Jay Inslee is not doing the same in Washington. Um, Pritzker in Illinois is not trying to do this. uh, Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan would love if Democrats took control of the state legislature, right? So you start there with this very odd dynamic where Andrew Cuomo actively for many years kept Republicans in control of the state Senate. And you may ask, you know, why was it that until the year 2019, New York state had Republicans in charge of the state Senate. And I can give you a long winded answer, but <laughs> what, what I'll say is that this is a dynamic Andrew Cuomo relished in. One, he was not that progressive. He was not someone who wanted to see the progressive wing of the Democratic Party have power in New York. He was very, very resistant to this. He philosoph- philosophically re- was resistant to this. He was a Clintonian triangulating Democrat he came out of the 1990s and he never really left. His view of the Democratic Party was fiscal conservatism married to a vague social liberalism. And in 2011, his first year in office, he got gay marriage passed in New York. This was a big milestone. His hope was that this would be enough for the left, that he could satiate them with legalizing same-sex marriage and move on and get back to cutting taxes cutting funding to CUNY, which I'm sure you know well, Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned Cuomo was really a disaster for public education in New York State and New York City, and and doing the things, you know, kind of like a a center-right Republican governor would do if they had the power to do it. Cuomo never quite governed like a Sam Brownback or John Kasich, in part because New York wouldn't allow him to. The unions are strong in New York. There are a lot of Democrats. You can only veer so far right and still hold power. But Cuomo was someone who, at every turn, would try to frustrate the ambitions of the left. Bill de Blasio said back in 2014, his first year in office, we should raise the minimum wage in New York City. At the time, it was really low. It was something like eight or nine dollars an hour, and now it now it's 15. And Cuomo said, "No, we're not not going to do it." You know, yeah. people over the years would say we should raise taxes on the wealthy. You know, New York has this this resource of wealthy people that are not fleeing the state, despite what everyone says. Um, we should 
find creative ways to raise more revenue. Cuomo would say, no, we're not doing it. We should fund CUNY and SUNY and our K-12 public schools, you know, more aggressively. Cuomo would say, we do enough. We don't have to do more. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, this, this over and over again, Democrats and progressives would try to push the state further to the left and Cuomo would be there to say no. And he would use the Republicans to block the change. And that's why they were so useful. He could always blame the Republicans when a bill of some kind um, wouldn't get through the legislature. You can say, well, not my problem. Another big thing, and I'll stop in a second, tenant <laughs> protections. Yeah. Um, yep. this, this, and this is a big one. New York City especially has a massive class of renters. You know, We are a renter city, an apartment city. We have a rent stabilization system that helps certain people in certain apartments stay there and and only see moderate rent increases. Andrew Cuomo was an enemy of the tenant movement from day one. He was very close to real estate developers and landlords. And any time any Democrat wanted to push forward a tenant-friendly legislation, Cuomo would have the Republicans block it. He'd block it himself. Again, it was only in 2019 when really against his will, uh, Democrats got together and strengthened New York City's, uh, New York State's tenant law for really the first time in like 50 years. I'm not really yeah. exaggerating. Like, yeah. like, like oh, sweeping, sweeping changes that made a difference. This had not happened in decades. Well, how, how, what I want to know is is how does how does coronavirus enter into this politics? Because it comes in, you know, I think everyone remembers sort of March 2020 as the moment where nationally people understand that this is going to be an issue. But the way it played out in New York was very, very specific. And I remember, I mean, a lot of different moments, but but one of them was just sort of wondering why de Blasio was taking so long in in closing the schools. Um, and your book gets into all of that and gets into how this this sort of uh, this sort of transpired. But I think a lot of people forget um, what Cuomo's attitude uh, and, and and certainly de Blasio's was too early on um, towards coronavirus. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because so much of it, I think, what was part partly what was shocking about reading your book is how much of Cuomo, in particular, like his response, became sort of talking points uh, um, among the right. Uh, and that response is something that Cuomo doesn't want us to remember. It's it's amazing how much got memory hold. And when I started to research this book, and, and I wrote it fairly quickly because I had done a lot of reporting on it, and um, I, I knew who to talk to. You know, it, it was not difficult in, in that sense because I was just kind of prepared to write it. And one of the things that I found, and I was even a bit surprised by it, I went back and watched all the old press conferences from February and March of 2020 that Cuomo conducted, read transcripts. The state in Cuomo's office posts these transcripts and they're, and they're very helpful. And the thing I, I found again and again, and, and, and even much later into the pandemic than I remembered is that Cuomo was downplaying the threat of COVID as late as March 11th of 2020. If you remember March 11th was the day the NBA suspended its season and Trump addressed the nation, and it became very apparent to most people COVID was a big deal. Yep. Andrew Cuomo was still comparing it to the flu. Mm. And he was doing this over and over again. He was doing it throughout February. He was doing it well into March. COVID's not a big deal. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We um, should not worry about it. Ebola was bad. SARS was bad. And this won't be like that. And And he said this, this is all public record. And compared it to a hurricane as well, which is interesting. Yes. He made analogies like the end of February. It's like a storm coming in. It might blow out to sea. It might not. And this is, it didn't make any sense because COVID was not a secret anymore. You could read the New York times every day. You can read what was going on in Wuhan, Italy. I compare it early in the book to the state of Washington, which did a very good job getting ready for COVID. And they had, COVID cases before New York state, but then they moved very aggressively to develop a strategy, um, you know, around warning people around school closures and other things. And, and, and there was very good coordination between the governor and the county level leadership, which did not exist in New York state. Andrew Mm -hmm. Cuomo did everything, would not inform county executives or or mayors of anything. It was his, his ship, only his ship to steer. Um, so you start there. He's downplaying the threat. Um, he he intentionally or unintentionally, and I, I don't know, was 
using conservative and Fox News talking points about COVID. One is the comparison to the flu. The second is that the only reason cases were increasing was because testing was increasing. If you remember, this was one of the very early arguments against COVID being a big deal was, well, we'll start to test and we'll find cases. And that's all it says, right? Nothing to worry about. Tests will show people are positive. Again, this was coming from the Cuomo playbook. So he's telling people not to worry. He's telling people it's hysteria. Um, you should still hug people, greet people, kiss people, do all these things, right? And then, and then say, the March 15th moment with de Blasio, which I remember where, where de Blasio is like, you should go out this weekend and go to the bars and enjoy yourselves. I thought he sounded psychotic. Uh, and and that, that seemed to echo what Cuomo was saying too, though. And, and these guys are going yes, to so, event, eventually reverse themselves, which is the, what the, I guess the, the memory holding is. De, de Blasio took all the heat because he was always more ham-handed than Cuomo. You know, Cuomo is a more adept politician than de Blasio. De Blasio is like a flawed center-left Democrat, not as bad a mayor as his reputation would suggest, but certainly someone who bungled the politics of, you know, his entire administration. And he would just say stupid things. And it was really early March, he sent out this very notorious tweet about going in to take a movie Go, go out and go out to film forum and, and, and see your favorite movies or something like that. It was, it was stupid. And it lived on infamy. Right. But Cuomo is right there with him just being less obviously inept, but in, in every way messaging in the same way, in some ways going further. I mean, Cuomo is doubling down again and again, day after day. This is not a big deal. This is like every other virus we've faced. And Hey, you know, remember Ebola. I mean, invoking Ebola was asinine because Ebola is not that contagious. It's much more deadly than COVID, COVID, but you can contain it fairly easily relative to COVID. So mm. again, you can't really compare the two. And the second major failure of Cuomo's early response was implementing a, a citywide and statewide shutdown order uh, too late. And, you know, de Blasio himself, who had been dragging his feet for a long time, finally said around March 17th, New York City needs a shelter in place order. And, you know, we're going to have to do what California was already doing, particularly Northern California, in instituting like a citywide or a statewide or, or, you know, multiple counties sort of coming together to do a shelter in place. And that's what Gavin Newsom and London Breed um, and the county executives out there did, as you know, um, pretty early on and aggressively, and it worked. I mean, San Francisco's COVID death toll is still pretty low. So uh, why? So why the hesitation? Yeah. I mean, uh, we Trump's. I sort think of, I think because Tr- De Blasio suggested yeah. it first. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just say that because you know, like Trump's hesitation was pretty obviously like I mean, he just didn't want it to affect Wall Street, didn't want to affect his politics. When I think about New York City, I think about Cuomo, I think about. Wall Street and Capitol being this sort of power in the city. Um, is, is that part of what is going on here where Cuomo is sort of, um, you know, Cuomo is hesitating to shut down because he just doesn't want to deal with the reality of what how this is going to impact the city's economy? You know, it's it's a very good question. I, I've answered before, and, and I genuinely think this is partly the case that because de Blasio went out on TV and said we need a shelter in place, Cuomo was not going to do it then because he didn't want it to seem like he was being pressured by anyone to do anything. You know, remember Cuomo was someone who was very much obsessed with wielding power of dominating others. This was his MO from the very beginning of his career. And he was not going to be upstaged by the mayor of New York city and by Bill de Blasio. Right. Right. And he was the one who would say New York gets the shelter in place or doesn't get the shelter in place. And so what he did is he waited five more days and announced something called New York pause, which was a statewide shutdown And that was really the beginning of New York's um, lockdown at the end of March. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time he was using excuses like we have to do it statewide or we can't do it at all. Even though in California, as you know, there were county level shutdowns did vary across the state. Um, And, you know, in one hand, look, to institute a, a shutdown, a lockdown, whatever is very difficult. I don't think they make sense anymore. I think they made sense early on in the pandemic. But I I do really think that Bill de Blasio suggesting at first Mm. caused Cuomo to wait to do it on his terms. 
Yeah. So, it's like, I mean, there's like, there's a personal element to this. Yes. Much of Cuomo's governing was deeply personal and that's what made it inefficient and quasi corrupt in many ways is because decisions would really be made in a somewhat authoritarian manner and would be based on politics and politics really governed a lot of what he did. So he has to rewrite history in the middle of this in some way. I mean, you mentioned this like absurd, I think it went viral sort of like this, this like poster that was created that was sort of like this, uh, a bunch of uh, images uh, of, of New York defeating the coronavirus. And one of the images on there is like Trump saying like, it's just the flu, which is like just so amazing that they would sort of put that attitude on Trump when it was their attitude as well. And the sort of like fundamental direction of their policy was the same thing. Um, how did they, how did Cuomo engineer this? Cause it seems like media has a lot to do with this, this sort of like reversal. And all of a sudden he's the coronavirus Avenger, as opposed to the guy who's saying it's just the flu. Don't worry about it. it the, the poster was one of the more <laughs> notorious parts of, of Cuomo's, you know, self aggrandizing strategy that was also aided and abetted by the media in every turn. Mm -hmm. And he was someone you know, who, yes, he was able to rewrite history pretty much on the fly. He was successful because a lot of, of people in cable television, in broadcast television, at major newspapers were willing to protect and, um, expand on this narrative and there's a, there's a lot of great reporting from the pandemic and a lot of new york city reporters did an outstanding job but there absolutely was a full-scale catering to this cuomo narrative that he rescued the state and the city and he successfully led people out of the start time and it didn't make any sense because of the death toll right numbers don't lie new york state Still to this day, I have to check the number. Still to this day, we are 1.5 years into COVID, Delta, all this stuff. I believe may still have the second highest deaths per capita in America, and that's mm. second to New Jersey. Mm. Maybe I know there are some southern states that were threatening to push New York out of the top two. I don't know if that's happened. But the point is that New York's death toll was so insanely high that a year and a half later when people are screaming about how crazy Florida is and Louisiana and all these states are, New York still saw a higher rate of death. And Cuomo could not have prevented all those deaths. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. But the question is, why didn't New York respond in the way Washington state did? And that, that's always the example I look at where it was a very like level-headed um, response that coordinated with local officials and listened to public health experts. And what you see again and again when you follow Cuomo is public health experts only mattered if they were telling Cuomo what he wanted to hear. And his public health commissioner, who I believe should be dumped by the new governor, Kathy Hochul, he was right there doing the bidding of the governor, not pushing back effectively. Mm. And you got a very politicized response to COVID. You got a response right. on Cuomo's terms that would burnish his image as much as possible. Yeah, I love how you point out that the these other governors in states like Washington, um, they didn't write memoirs. Uh, you know, they weren't they weren't playing the press in, in in the same way. And it seems like that's part of a larger a larger trend in in Cuomo's governorship is the sort of media angle of it. But yeah, watching watching that Cuomo sexual hashtag um, become dominant in, in even like liberal media spaces was really, um, uh, I don't know, nauseating um, because of those deaths. And yeah, we can't like just say Andrew Cuomo caused all these deaths, but it seems like the politics that you're laying out in your book are uh, a, a part of why this was so bad in New York. I mean, Cuomo says that it's the density of New York that created all these deaths, but it seems like that's a way of deflecting from the decisions that were made. I wonder if you could talk about probably the thing that gets the most attention, which is the nursing homes. I don't think a lot of people outside of New York or even inside New York understand exactly what that decision was and why it created so much death and also 
how Cuomo's office hid those deaths uh, by juking the stats. So the nursing home issue actually was not not as complicated as it seemed. There, there are a few parts to it. One, Cuomo was blamed by a lot of people, particularly conservatives, for fueling the spread of COVID in nursing homes by forcing um, COVID patients who are in hospitals to return to the nursing homes that they came from. Mm -hmm. So bringing someone gets COVID, gets moved to a hospital, they may still be COVID positive. And Cuomo said they've got to go back to the nursing home rather than stay in the hospital or go to a makeshift facility. And this was a, a directive Cuomo put forth in March of 2020. He said it was the CDC that recommended it. This was not really true. This was not a hard recommendation coming from anywhere. It was not a policy that was implemented in other states. So I am not convinced this fueled the spread of COVID in nursing homes just because I think that was inevitable. Mm. And this is always going to be a problem. And it wasn't just a problem in New York. Um, certainly New York had a lack of PPE and um, you, you had a poor state response and not enough safeguards in place um, for nursing homes and healthcare facilities. But th this is a problem that uh, was a problem nationally. Mm. What Cuomo did that was really different and really egregious in many ways was purposefully undercount the death toll in nursing homes. And the way he did this was he instituted a rule that if a nursing home resident got COVID and was transferred to a hospital where they died, you would not count that as a nursing home death. You would just put it into the general tally of COVID deaths. So imagine that someone's lived in a nursing home for, for 10 years, they got COVID, they are very sick, an ambulance is called, if that ambulance takes them to a hospital and they die, you're not in the nursing home death toll anymore. It's nonsensical. Whereas if you happen to drop dead in a nursing home itself, physically, you are counted in the nursing home death toll, mm. Um, mm -hmm. which we know right. doesn't make sense because if you're sick, an ambulance gets called. So what happened with this was you had many months where New York's nursing home death toll was artificially low. Cuomo could claim in his memoir that look, COVID in nursing homes is not a big problem because we have the numbers to say it wasn't a problem. And then, uh, you know, families who said this is an issue, the, the administration go, well, it's not really an issue because only X thousands of people died in nursing homes right. compared to the overall death toll, which was immense. So purposefully uh, manipulating and um, hiding those numbers and then also he allowed nursing homes and healthcare facilities to get sweeping um, legal immunity, the, the very immunity shields that Mitch McConnell was pushing for in Washington, Cuomo implemented in New York. And, and the immunity was eventually weakened, but it was so strong that at one time, if you suffered a, a non-COVID uh, medical malpractice issue in a hospital or a nursing home, you could not sue that hospitals and nursing homes were being protected fully from all types of legal action. And this was unprecedented and very much an overreach. And this was done by Cuomo in consultation with the um, hospital industry lobby, which is very powerful in New York. One well, of the most I, powerful. Right. Well, there's a perfect example of part of explaining what's happening here. I feel like it, that your book does very well is Cuomo's connection to those corporate interests. And it seems like that's something that other Democrats sort of just, you know, that either were a part of or understood and progressive Democrats certainly understood was a barrier to any kind of uh, any kind of progressive uh, movement in the state, particularly when Cuomo has such a stranglehold over the over the budget, et cetera. Um, but I wonder um, about that, that those other Democrats and, and how, you know, they had to sort of like, I don't know, put up with this in part because that that's how they got, you know, money for their district, no matter what they had to, they had to sign on to these bills. So in other words, they have very little power to do anything, but how does that, it seems like there's an irony to your story because it seems like all this coronavirus, I mean, ultimately um, what, what uh, Cuomo does in, during to, to handle this is like um, the accountability for it comes comes from a different direction. Um, and I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering how we narrate that and how how history will narrate how Cuomo got taken down, because there is a sort of weird irony to the, the sexual harassment stuff being what he 
eventually, you know, leaves office over. Um, how much are other Democrats a part of that? Because it seems like them turning on him is 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 a, is a part of this. And coronavirus was part of that turn. Yes. Unfortunately, COVID was not enough. Cuomo's handling of COVID, his scandals, his hiding of nursing home deaths, his failure to respond to the pandemic adequately, his attempts to cut Medicaid funding to hospitals and, and onward and onward. Unfortunately, none of this was enough to end Cuomo's political career. And I, until January or February of this year, I would have said easily Cuomo wins fourth term. He'd been governor for three terms. New York has no term limits. He had tons of money. He was going to steamroll his way next year to a fourth term. I don't want to interrupt, but but there was also the other element which seemed like he was like Trump in his personality, a guy who never admits mistakes. It it feels like admitting weakness is is like the worst mistake you can make as a politician. And so seeing him resign was very surprising to me for that reason as well. Yes, Cuomo never in his political career admitted error of any kind. And he was like a smarter Trump. It's like if Trump had a degree <laughs> right. of competence and, and self-awareness um, and, and, you know, had kind of an ability to function like a, a semi-normal human being. Andrew Cuomo is someone who internalized a, a lesson very early on that to admit any kind of error was a sign of weakness. And you don't do that. So you have a governor who is very powerful, who most Democrats are afraid to challenge and cross in any way, and who was even throughout COVID and through the failures of COVID, very well positioned to run for a fourth term. And then the accusations come out. Not a lot of people saw them coming. I didn't see them coming. Certainly you'd heard, you know, you'd been aware of Cuomo being flirtatious maybe, he had an odd demeanor um, at times and kind of an odd way of speaking and interacting with people. But again, these accusations came and they were very serious and they emerged very quickly. And they were what got Cuomo out of office. Mm-hmm. I, do, I do believe that his handling of COVID and the nursing home scandal was a subtext here where a lot of Democrats wanted Cuomo gone and the sexual harassment scandal was the most viable way to do it. You had a lot of Democrats deciding, well, this is what will push him out. We want him gone and we'll do it this way. Kind of like how OJ went to prison for robbery, but everyone felt it was like he was going to prison really for the murders. It was, it was a way to hold him accountable Mm-hmm, in, right. in, in the most politically viable manner, because the other ways were not working. The legislature is not threatening to impeach Cuomo over COVID. They would impeach him over sexual harassment and assault. And I guess was, I'm wondering how explicit was that uh, was that among among the people who were generating these investigations? You know, like how explicit were they in saying, look, we're never going to get him on the COVID stuff, but we can definitely get him on the sexual harassment stuff. Or is that not it was not explicit. No, it was not explicit at all. And if you talk to most people, they would say it was the sexual harassment. But I do think that was a subtext. And and certainly what ended Cuomo was the rep- a report from the state attorney general, Letitia James, and she was an ally of his. She ran on his ticket in 2018. And it was, mm-hmm. it was notable that she deputized investigators to look into these sexual harassment complaints and then put forth a pretty damning report about them. And it was this report's release that spelled the end for Cuomo and had every Democrat of note, every labor union of note turning on him and making it untenable for him to continue as governor, particularly because impeachment became a very real threat and the state Senate was willing to convict Cuomo at trial. And he could have been removed from office. So he was telling the truth in his press conference when he said, like, look, this will be too big a distraction. I won't be able to lead. That's basically exactly right. If it was it was correct in the sense that it would have been a very big deal and would have uh, taken a lot of oxygen out of other initiatives and Mm. would have been the primary focus of most people. But uh, the the impression he gave off which was not true is that he would have fought fought this and won 
but he decided not to fight for the good of New York. Mm. That's not correct. He would have lost Nixonian. if he fought it. He was, yes, he was very, uh, and in some ways, a even more venal and uh, corrupt uh, Richard Nixon. Yes. And he was not going to win. He had no path to victory, but in his head, or at least publicly, he could say, well, I would have won, but I'm leaving for the good of the state. And not really true. If he didn't leave, this legislature would have dragged him out of office. I wonder if you can, uh, there's a lot of shocking stuff in your book, honestly. Um, but even for people who I think follow New York politics, but one of, one of them, I think that a lot of people don't know about that. I, 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 I hope you could talk a bit about is the independent democratic conference, the IDC and what that is, because it seems like it gets to the heart of why other Democrats are going to eventually sort of, I don't know. Um, there, there's going to be that underlying tension within the party when they understand sort of where Cuomo's loyalties are and how he's playing, how, how he's playing this particular New York politics. The IDC was a group of Democrats. It, it got as large as eight who formed their own caucus in the state Senate to govern with the Republicans and help keep them in majority. This was never seen in New York before. This is not really done anywhere else. And the IDC started in 2011 and they really kicked into gear after the 2012 elections when Democrats won enough seats to take the majority. And the IDC said, well, instead of letting the Democrats be in charge, we will partner with the Republicans to help them stay in charge. Hmm. For the IDC itself, it <laughs> led to a great amount of power for the individual members. They were able to be in the majority. They got more money. They got more resources, bigger offices, more ability to push their own priorities. And the IDC leader, Jeff Klein, was one of the most powerful politicians in the state of New York. For Cuomo, it was great because he could keep the Republicans in the majority. He could use the chaos um, and infighting in the state legislature to lend him ad additional power. It was a divide and conquer strategy. And Cuomo in every way aided the IDC. He encouraged their formation. He never challenged them. He worked closely with the IDC leader. He would hire former IDC staffers. And this was an arrangement that he would have been content to allow for as long as possible. Mm. And he only wasn't able to because progressives launched primaries in 2018 against all the IDC members and were able to defeat six of them. Wow. And that, that really ended them there. And that was, yeah, that was very important. Actually, exactly. It's say September 13th. I believe that was exactly three years ago those, those primaries took place well i mean i guess the, the bigger question for me for anyone that follows like i don't know the history of new york city and new york city politics is how much how much w w it, it, will this disrupt that historic uh power imbalance because it seems like with a new governor and and also perhaps a, a new mayor named eric adams depending on how things go it seems like a new moment in some ways, but at the same time, kind of a, a, a nuanced one as well. Um, I don't know. I wonder what the direction of New York City politics are without Cuomo, because it seems like on the one hand, Cuomo is the, the strong man that, that had this you know, really powerful effect on the direction of the city. On the other hand, it seems like Cuomo was just taking advantage of the, the political economy of the state that's been there for decades. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I do think this dynamic will be much more beneficial to New York City Democrats, to progressives in particular. One, because the legislature will have a lot more power with Cuomo gone. Um, Kathy Hochul is a new governor. She has to run for election next year. She's going to have to work with members of the legislature. She is going to have to appease them, to sign their bills, to do all of these, you know, various things that Cuomo would not have wanted to do at all. So the, the leverage is now with the legislature. The legislature is in many ways dominated by Democrats from New York City now. This is not always the case, but it's the case now. The progressive faction in the state Senate is quite large. It includes two members of DSA, 
and then the assembly has a growing uh, socialist wing. It's it's small, but it's growing along with some younger progressives. So the leverage has definitely swung to legislators in New York City who are Democrats. Mm. And so the next Adam, mayor, Adam, Eric Adams, Adams is yeah. not a DSA guy, though, right? I mean, it seems no. like <laughs> no, it's Adams is not. Adams is very much a moderate, very close to the real estate industry, uh, very much a it would have been a Cuomo friendly governor, uh, mayor of New York. The question really is, what is Adams's Albany agenda? When Bill de Blasio came into office, his Albany agenda was very clear. Get a tax hike to fund his universal pre-K program. The Republicans controlled the state Senate, did not want to raise taxes. Andrew Cuomo said the same. We're not going to raise taxes. Eventually, he provided state funding for the program. But it was very clear what the Albany asks were. You had progressives and left of center Democrats in New York City trying to get Republicans upstate to do stuff. Now you have Democrats running everything. Eric Adams in some ways might be the most conservative actor in that kind of city state dynamic. Yeah. Now, will he push for changes in Albany? Will he try to either arrest the change in Albany. We don't know. He doesn't have a lot of leverage to do it either way. And you might see progressives in the state legislature acting on behalf of New York City and changing law without much input from the mayor. They don't need that input. They can act on their own. This was a dynamic that was always poisonous for New York City, but now it's one that could actually work to its advantage. You have a great piece on your Substack, and I would direct uh, Nostalgia Trap listeners to get your book and to read your Substack, because I think you you touch on a lot of the contradictions um, of not only New York City politics, but the connection to larger left ideas, etc. Um, but one of them, is, I, I thought, that, that caught my attention is a piece on Robert Moses. And you do mention Robert Moses in your book on uh, on Cuomo, too. That Moses is this figure that, like, sort of, you know, deftly took advantage of New York City politics and really... Uh, made a mark on the city in really, really uh, powerful ways, both good and bad, I guess. I mean, that's the most um, general, I guess, assessment of Moses I could give. But but Moses is also someone who, you know, I've got my, I'm a good left academic that's got my power broker copy behind me on the bookshelf. Um, and, and part of the, that story also is, is Moses like um, becoming a villain after, after being a hero for so long. Um, you sort of wonder wh- if the same will, will happen to Cuomo, how, how much he's like Moses in that sense. Um, but, I, but I also you know, wanted to ask you about your piece, which kind of speculates about like, well, would it be so bad to have a Moses-like figure if he did progressive things? Um, and, and that sort of, I, I thought that was sort of touching on a little bit, bit of what a lot of your work is, is about, which is sort of kind of un- trying to imagine what the possibilities are for New York City politics um, with this history and this power structure. Does that make sense? Yes. So, you know, Moses obviously is a villain in many ways and accelerated this auto centric, um, automobile centric, uh, style development, um, that really, uh, left, uh, a very mixed negative legacy in New York city, you know, created many, um, highways destroyed, neighborhoods, um, and also deprived uh, public transit of real investment. Uh, Moses could have been a force for good. And I I don't want to say I I want someone else to have the authoritarian power of Moses to suddenly (laughs) do great urban transit projects. But it's just notable to me how much was able to get done in a relatively a uh, short amount of time, you know, Moses's reign was 40 years, but you know, a lot of these projects were done in kind of a, a 30 year period and it was, or, or less, and it was remarkable how much was built. And you wonder what if Cuomo could have been Cuomo, but cared about the subway system. Cuomo did not care about the subway system at all. He spent a lot of money to rehab LaGuardia airport to build a, a few new bridges to do some wasteful uh, cosmetic projects, but really the subway deteriorated. You know, what if you had someone who wielded power, but did it for good? And unfortunately don't see that very much. And that's an argument against the concentration of power in in fewer hands. And I'm sympathetic to that, but it is interesting to think about how 
Moses was able to do so much. Cuomo, of course, like like no governor could do as much as Moses. Um, but you know, Cuomo really was this bullying, quasi authoritarian figure who didn't get a lot done. Mm. He got a lot done relative to some previous governors who are quite weak. But in the grand scheme of what New York needed, there was so much left undone. And the focus was not really what it should have been. And, you know, the focus really should have been on on projects that can really benefit the working class and poor of New York City and state. And that was not the case. Well, I mean, it's a long story, but it seems like it's connected to his family history and to Mario Cuomo as governor and Andrew Cuomo's sort of relationship with his father and wanting to uh, create a different sort of legacy. But I wonder, I mean, part part of this, it seems like the impetus for you writing this book is is to play play a part in that public legacy uh, and how he's remembered. I mean, how how do we think what, what I mean, what even in Cuomo's mind, what will he be remembered for? Uh, I wonder if he's still thinking that that if nothing else, he'll be remembered for being a, a hero during the coronavirus, which is really, really weird to think that that's might be his legacy. <sighs> It's a good question. You know, what will Cuomo's legacy be? I mean, it's important to remember that previous governors have not left great legacies. You know, Mario Cuomo's legacy is really being this liberal beacon in a time of conservative dominance and, and giving a speech at DNC. There was not really much in New York State he did. Um, you know, he he, he left a, a pretty weak imprint. Um, George Pataki similarly mm-hmm. had no great legacy. You know, I think Cuomo. Cuomo got more ta- had two more tangible accomplishments than either man. Like that's an arguable. I think you could argue he's a better governor than his father, and I wouldn't really dispute that. I, I think Mario Cuomo is a vastly overrated governor. I don't know what his legacy will be. You know, uh, COVID on one hand seems fleeting because the pandemic is going to be this multi year thing, and I think when you look back on it, you'll go, "Wow, look at all the people that died." And I don't think it'll make much sense to look at New York in 2040 or 2050 and and read it, read the history of it and go, wow, didn't Cuomo do a great job giving press conferences as people die? It's just not something that makes a lot of sense. You know, FDR had this legacy, but he was guiding people through economic catastrophe he did not cause. Mm. Um, and then also comforting people during the war. And of course, doing good. So I don't know if it's COVID. And then what are the physical projects? There was the new Tappan Zee Bridge, which you know, was necessary, but also was a flawed project. Um, new York City got three more stops in the Second Avenue subway. I don't even know if that's going to be associated with Cuomo, and I don't think people are that impressed by it. Um, you know, legal maybe legalizing same-sex marriage to this day. That's probably the most courageous and difficult thing he did as governor, mm-hmm. and he did it right away. So it could be that. Well, I, yeah, I think mean, that that actually kind of gets, I think, to part of the, the why he became popular during that that moment when he's doing the COVID press conferences is among like sort of like soft liberals who were seeking an alternative to Trump and like a leader that was an alternative to Trump, and it seems like. I mean, one of the points you make, I think, is a pretty good one, is that like when Trump exits the national scene, particularly when he's not on Twitter anymore, all of a sudden Cuomo's the only guy standing there uh, and, and he doesn't have that contrast anymore. Uh, it seemed like he I mean, I get this straight from my parents, too, that, 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 you know, he provided a comfort during this time because Cuomo had this down to earth personality. And it seems like for a lot of people, that's enough. In other words, like I think you, you do enter into this in your book, like there's a television element to this. Um, and even an erotic element to it with Cuomo sexual and the brother, Chris Cuomo and all that seems like there's a lot for, um, for media people to talk about here in terms of what, what, what actually happened here. Um, if that makes sense. Yes, no, it it definitely does. And I think the media is complicit in, in many ways and deserves blame for the mythos that was created. Um, I did want to say, that you talk about legacy of Cuomo, the legacy is that he resigned from office. Resignations yeah. color much yep. of what you do. You know, it defined Richard Nixon's legacy, defined Elliot Spitzer's legacy, who resigned from office over a decade ago as governor of New York, and, and it's going to define Cuomo's legacy too. 
but yeah, it'll be interesting to think about like what, what will we remember and, and what of the absurdities of, of the era will we recall? I mean, Chris Cuomo and Andrew Cuomo, certainly um, that entire act, that mm-hmm. entire time of having a brother interview his governor brother on yeah. national TV Jesus. during the pandemic, uh, you know, future generations are going to judge that pretty harshly. And I think they, people already are but it was something that was incomprehensible at the time. Yeah, and now yeah. it's even worse. The, and and the, the, the language, it's funny because the language of Cuomo that's, you know, allegedly, you know, endearing to people, that sort of like neighborhood way of talking, it, it's Trump. I mean, the quotes that you give um, in here are not just Trump in the way of talking, but also as he's saying stuff like it's just the flu and things like that. I mean, uh, uh, there's a quote where, where he says something along like, you know, along the lines of, well, if you know, if you eat a lot of cheesecake, you get fat like that. That's no surprise. That's just one of those. That's, and, and that's why people should wear masks. And, and he was kind of like saying it's your fault if you don't, if you get sick. Um, and, and it seemed like none of that was based in science. All of that was came from a really um, similar sort of brutal place as as trump's logic um and i feel like i don't i don't know if that if if liberals will ever come to that place because there's a deep irony to the fact that they fell in love with him because he wasn't trump when he was saying the same things as trump in often the same really gross misogynist terms um that's to me is pretty mind-boggling andrew cuomo and donald trump are both sons of wealthy and well-known people from queens new york and there you go they have many similarities, but yes, it was really the vacuum Trump created and, and the um, odiousness of Trump that allowed Cuomo to flourish. I do think that if Joe Biden had been president in 2020 and attempting to wrangle with COVID, Cuomo would not have been a national hero, that so much of this was driven by liberals sitting at home, terrified, watching cable TV, and then finding comfort in Andrew Cuomo. Mm. And mm. he he existed because of Trump and existed in terms of you know his this new role for him. And it really I do think it wasn't a coincidence that, that Cuomo struggled mightily once Trump was gone, in part because the media could focus its attention on these scandals. You know, the sexual harassment scandals became national news. They were leading broadcasts, they were leading um, CNN, leading MSNBC. Would this have happened if Trump were in office? I don't know. It, it's interesting to think of an alternative universe where people <laughs> simply say, well, Trump was worse. Trump was worse. Why would we care? Like Trump was bad. You still had Democrats saying this, but there weren't as many and there weren't as many politicians who could say this. And with Trump gone, the stakes in some way were lower because you're not dumping Cuomo to save Trump. You're just dumping a a middling to destructive governor who, who, you know, had failed so mightily in in so many different ways. It's such an incredible story. Um, And, and I want, I'm, I thank you for coming on because I, I, you know, we're, I'm a historian and and thinking about history and sort of history being like written and rewritten in real time. Uh, Watching those press conferences was one of the most surreal elements of this for me. Um, And your book brought it all back and has so much detail in terms of what was going on behind the scenes. So I want to say the name again. Uh, the book the book is by Ross Barkin. It's called The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus, and the Fall of New York. Uh, and it's an absolutely necessary read if you want to understand what happened with coronavirus um, and Andrew Cuomo. Thanks, Ross. This is really fun. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great to be on. All right, I think that's going to do it for today. I want to thank my guest, Ross Barkin. Go get his book. It's called The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus, and the Fall of New York. It will make you hate Andrew Cuomo even more, if that's even possible. And go check out our bonus episode on Cuomo. It's called Cuomo Sexuality with Justin Rogers Cooper. Justin and I wanted to take a lot of Ross's ideas and and put them into the the, the trap matrix. And by that, I just mean we wanted to sort of figure out why liberals fell for Cuomo uh, and what are the sort of erotic elements of that. Why do people need a daddy, especially in times of crisis? And how is that a part of our national politics, etc.? Go check that out at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Episode is called Cuomo Sexuality. And if you 
Subscribe to our show. You'll get access to all our bonus episodes, including our 9-11 trilogy, which a lot of people have been responding to. We thank you for those that are subscribed to the show. It helps make the whole thing go. And we appreciate you listening as well. So we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.